Stoti, everyone. Welcome to the study group with Venerable Yutadamo. He is joining us in from Thailand. Um, before we start reading, uh, we just need someone to lead the precepts. Is there anyone that would like to lead the precepts today? I would like to. Ahung bante ti sarane na sahapan chasi lani ya chami. Dutiyam pi ahung bante ti sarane na sahapan chasi lani ya chami. Dutiyam pi ahung bante ti sarane na sahapan chasi lani ya chami. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. 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 Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambudhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambudhasa. Buddhang saranang gachami. Buddhang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Ti saranagamanang ititang. Amang bante. Anati pata veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Pana tipata we ramani sika padang samadiyami. Adina dana we ramani sika padang samadiyami. Adina dana we ramani sika padang samadiyami. Ame su mitchachara we ramani sika padang samadiyami. Kame sumi cha cha ra ve ramani sika padang samadhyami. Musa vada ve ramani sika padang samadhyami. Musa vada ve ramani sika padang samadhyami. Sura meraya majapa madarthana ve ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura meraya majapa madarthana ve ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Imani pancha sikha padani silena sugating yanti silena bhoga sampada. Sile na nibuting yan ti tasma si lang wiso dahye. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, 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 sadu. Chapter 3, paragraph 43. Gain is the four requisites. How are they an impediment? Wherever a meritorious bhikkhu goes, people give him a large supply of requisites. With giving, blessings to them and teaching them the Dhamma, he gets no chance to do the ascetic's duties. 
From sunrise till the first watch of the night, he never breaks his association with people. Again, even at dawn, alms food eaters found fond of opulence come and say, Venerable sir, such and such a man lay follower, woman lay follower, friend, friend's daughter wants to see you. And being ready to go, he replies, Take the bowl and robe, friend. So he's always on the alert. Thus, these requisites are an impediment for him. He should leave this group and wander by himself where he is not known. This is the way his impediment is severed. Class is a class group of students of suttas and students of Abhidhamma. If with the group's instructions and questioning, he gets no opportunity for the ascetic's duties, then that group is an impediment for him. He should sever that impediment in this way. If those bhikkhus have already acquired the main part and little still remains, he should finish that off and then go to the forest. If they have only acquired little and much still remains, he should, without traveling more than a league, approach another instructor of a class within the radius of a league and say, help those venerable ones with instruction, etc. If he does not find anyone in this way, he should take leave of the class, saying, I have a task to see to, friends. Go where it suits you, and he should do his own work. I think there's um, a mistake in 43 in the translation. I notice it because it makes sense where he says, again, even at dawn, alms food eaters fond of opulence. Why the heck would alms food eaters be fond of opulence? And I don't see the word fond of opulence. Maybe I'm missing it. Because it seems like what's being said here is that monks who don't want to accept these things. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear. It's weird that it says alms food. What it's actually saying is in the very early morning, before the sun, it means before the sun has, before dawn has, has arisen, those who are accustomed to going on alms round, who don't want to get caught up in dealing with these people who want to go on alms round, right? Because it's getting around the time where they would go on alms round. They say, uh, hey, these people are here. Can you talk to them? This is because this guy is thinking, oh, if I go, then they'll give me things. So the, uh, the gain is an impediment. But here, I guess the idea is not just where one is uh, greedy about about gain. It's just um, they become a, a, an impediment because people want to give them to the good monk. It's a good person. The monk is a good person, good monk. But people want to give them lots of things, and that becomes an impediment because they have to constantly be engaging with these people who want to give them things. But anyway, so I, I think the word fond of opulence, I don't see it there. It doesn't make any sense that it wow. should be there. In the Sinhalese version, I see the term Pratyaloli. Pratyaloli means being fond of requisites. The alms food eaters are fond of requisites? That's weird. Yeah, in the morning, um, because Pindapatika, because who are fond of requisites. Oh, I, okay, okay. I guess it's these, right, so I misunderstood it. It's uh, monks who are fond of chasing after alms food is the idea because they take him with them. He says, take the bowl and robes, which means take my bowl and outer robes. So he will lead them. Okay, that well, makes sense then. So these people want him to go with them to to get things because they're greedy. Even if he's not greedy, he still has to go with them because... They want uh, they want him to go, and probably because he's a meritorious monk. If they if he goes, uh, they'll get more. Or the the lay people are requesting him. So if he doesn't go, the lay people won't offer anything. So the monks get involved in it. But the, but the same sunrise till the first watch of the night. He never breaks his association with people. That is also something that is not uh, desired for the for a monk as well, isn't it? Right. But it's the point is that it's because of these lay people are always coming to offer things to the monks. It's an odd uh, it's a, it's a it's a an odd sort of 
teaching because we're taught that you know giving things is good, charity is good, and monks are taught that it's a great thing to accept the things that people offer. But um, there's the dark side of that. The negative side of that is that while well, monks get greedy, of course, and and are preaching the giving and preaching for in- hinting and encouraging people to to be fixated on generosity, which of course isn't an integral part of the path. So it, this is an example of how fixation on charity can be misguided, can lead to disturbance. So you have to consider. Do the monks really need things? Are you giving things because the monks really need things? And if the monks don't need things, are you are you going to just be bothering them? And that's okay to do a little bit of bothering, but is it going to be bothering them all the time? Many people bothering them, asking what they need, and so on. Mostly we're just really thankful when people ask us what we need and offer us things that we need. But it is something to keep in mind. It's the kind of thing that probably happens commonly in Thailand especially when in a village monastery where there's one monk and they're constantly having to attend funerals and uh, birthdays and Ajahn Tong had a bit of this problem there were always, there were many many people coming to see him every day people coming to see him for him I don't think it was much of a problem though why do people invite uh, the monk to the funeral what well to teach funerals are times where people need Support, advice, some insight into how to deal with loss. It's also a time of time of making merit. You want to do something good on behalf of the person who passed away. You make offerings to the monks for, on behalf of the person who passed away. And the monks will often do chanting as a means of making feel, people feel better. Sort of chanting as a way of supporting the person who passed away, if they're listening, that sort of thing. Thank you. 45. Building. Kama. Is new building work. Navakama. Since one engaged in this must know about what material has and has not been got by carpenters, etc. And must see about what has and has not been done. It is always an impediment. It should be severed in this way. If little remains, it should be completed. If much remains, it should be handed over to the community or to bhikkhus who are entrusted with the community's affairs. If it is a new building for the community or if it is for himself, it should be handed over to those whom he entrusts with his own affairs. But if it is not, uh, if if these are not available, he should relinquish it to the community and depart. So remember, these are these these are for someone who has decided that they're going to undertake intensive practice and meditation. Most of these things, like number four especially, right, are things that monks can and do and should engage in, uh, but much more important is they should be focused. On, they should be intent on meditation so uh, from time to time at the very least they should give up all these things and and as you say as it says you relinquish them to others tell other people to do it find someone else to teach and it's not like uh, passing the buck or something you know it can be taking turns you find someone to teach for you temporarily you go and practice and once you've attain the results you were hoping for, then you come back and teach again. So it's not that these are any of them bad things. And again, these can all be adapted for lay people in a way. Now, m- most of these are severed when a lay person leaves home. But there's worry about a lot of these things, like worry about your family is a very common one for lay people. Worry about your home. Worry about your affairs, worry about your work, right? Building isn't just building. I mean, for monks, that's about the most they get into physical labor, but it can be your job. Be worried about your job or thinking about your work or your business or that sort of thing. Thinking about money. These are all very much applicable, not just to monks, if you adapt them. So the idea is to settle your affairs before you undertake intensive meditation. Make sure you're not 
worried about these things or having to deal with these things during your period of intensive meditation? 46. Travel is going on a journey. If someone is expected to give the going forth somewhere else, or if some requisite is obtainable there, and he cannot rest content without getting it, then that will be an impediment. For even if he goes into the forest to do the aesthetics duty, he will find it hard to get rid of thoughts about the journey. So, one in this position should apply himself to the aesthetics duties after he has done the journey and transcend the business. Visas here in Thailand, it's kind of related to this one, is that people often have a lot of anxiety, worry, and bother just bother about getting visas. Sometimes there's nothing you can do about that, and you just have to be as mindful as you can. We have people who, in the middle of their course, have to go and extend their visa. Often here, people will come for a short time and then decide they want to stay longer, but their visa has to be extended, so they have to interrupt their practice to go and do that. Um, the ascetic duties, do they refer only to meditation or something else as well? I think that's referring to Dutanga. But I think the implication is meditation as well. Oh no, it's, yeah, it's not the Dutanga. It's it's referring to meditation. I mean, it's called Samana Dhamma is the word. And that means the Dhamma of a true reckless. Ascetic is not the right word here. Duty isn't really the right word either. It's the uh, dhamma of a of a monk or the 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 religious practice. I would you could translate it as something like religious practice. Samana dhamma, recluse's practice. You you can also remember that in the time of the Buddha, dhamma was um, was already used. By other religion, by by the Brahmins, by the Hindus, Dharma was uh, talked about as one's code or religion or one's one's way of practice. So Samana Dhamma is the way of the Samana, the way of the recluse, the way of the shaman. It's where the word shaman comes from. So the way of one who has left the world. To seek out spirituality or seek out higher practices. Ascetic duty is not what I would use to translate that, what I would translate it as there. 47. Kin. In the case of the monastery, means teacher, preceptor, co resident, pupil, those with the same preceptor as oneself, and those with the same teacher as oneself. And in the case of the house, it means mother, father, brother, and so on. When they are sick, they are an impediment for him. Therefore, that impediment should be severed by curing them with nursing. Herein, when the preceptor is sick, he must be cared for as long as life lasts, if the sickness does not soon depart. Likewise, the teacher at the going forth, the teacher at the admission, the co-resident, the pupils to whom one has given the admission in the going forth, and those who have the same preceptor, but the teacher from whom one takes the dependence, the teacher who gives one instruction, the pupil to whom one has given the dependence, the pupil to whom one has given the instruction, and those who have that same teacher as oneself should be looked at after as long as the dependence on the instructor has not been terminated. If one is able to do so, one should look after them even beyond that period. 49. Mother and father should be treated like the preceptor. If they live within the kingdom and look, for, look to their son for help, it should be given. Also, if they have no medicine, he should give them his own. If he has none, he should go in search of it as alms and give that. But in the case of brothers or sisters, one should only give them what is theirs. If they have none, then one should give one's own temporarily and, and later get it back. But one should not complain if one does not get it back. It is not allowed either to make medicine for or to give it to a sister's husband who is not related by blood. 
but one can give it to one's sister, saying, Give it to your husband. The same applies to one's brother's wife. But it is allowed to make it for their children since they are blood relatives. So the idea is to avoid having to do any of this, but these are the all he's saying here is these are the exceptions wherein a monk can't avoid having to take care of one's relatives or be in, in, involved with them. And so, I mean, this this applies very much to everyone, to not just monks. Don't get caught up during your, your intensive practice. You temporarily cut ties with most people. And unless it's really a serious issue where someone is ill and needs your help, you uh, tell them you're going to be away for some time. I guess cut ties isn't the right word. You, you go out of contact temporarily. 50. 8. Affliction. Affliction is any kind of illness. It is an impediment when it is actually afflicting. Therefore, it should be severed by treatment with medicine. But if it is not cured after taking medicine for a, for a few days, then the, the ascetic's duty should be done after apostrophizing one's person in this way. I am not your slave or your hireling. I have come to suffering through maintaining you through the beginning of this round round of rebirths. Is that about uh, one's own illness? Yes. I do not understand the the last quotation. I am not your slave, are you? Talking to oneself. Talking to the body. Okay, thank you. So this is saying that if this illness remains to continue doing the work anyway, even if it gets worse, yeah, well, if there's nothing, if it, if you can't cure it, then you you just say you just remind yourself, hey, I'm just going to ignore you. Then if you're not going to if you're not going to follow along, this is more important than you are. And if I die, I die. Fifty one, nine books means responsibility for the scriptures. That is an impediment only for one who is constantly busy with recitations, etc., but not for others. Here are relevant stories. The elder Ravata, it seems, the Majahima reciter, went to the elder Ravata, the dweller in Malaya, the hill country, and asked him for a meditation subject. The elder asked him, How are you in the scriptures, friend? I am studying the Majima, Nikaya, venerable sir. The Majima is a hard responsibility, friend. When a man is still learning the first 50 by heart, he is faced with the middle 50. And when he is still learning that by heart, he is faced with the last 50. How can you take up a meditation subject? Venerable sir, when I have taken a meditation subject from you, I shall not look at the scriptures again. He took the meditation subject, and doing no recitation for 19 years, he reached our hanship in the 20th year. He told bhikkhus who came for recitation, I have not looked at the scriptures for 20 years, friends, yet I am familiar with them. You may begin. And from beginning to end, he had no hesitation, even over a single syllable. You imagine, and that's only a small part of the Buddha's teaching, but 152, we went, this was the last thing we studied. Could you imagine being able to memorize all of that? And that's only a part of what some monks memorize. What's nice here is the acknowledgement that someone who has a clear mind can have a great memory of the text. 52. The elder Mahanaga, too, who lived at Karuliyagiri, put aside the scriptures for 18 years, and then he recited the Datu Katha to the bhikkhus. When they checked this with the town dwelling elders of Anuradha Pura, not a single question was found out of its order. 53. In the great monastery, too, the elder Tipitaka Chula Abhaya had the golden drum struck, saying, I shall expound the three Pitakas in the circle of experts in the five collections of discourses. And this was before he had learned the commentaries. The community of Bhikkhu said, Which teacher's teaching is is it unless you give only the teaching of our own teachers we shall not let you speak also his 
preceptor asked him when he went to wait on him, Did you have the drum beaten, friend? Yes, venerable sir. For what reason? I shall expound the scriptures, venerable sir. Friend Abaya, how do the teachers explain this passage? They explain it in this way, venerable sir. The elder descended, saying, hmm. Again, three times, each time in a different way, he said, They explain it in this way, venerable sir. The elder always descended, saying, hmm. Then he said, Friend, your first explanation was the way of the teachers, but it is because you have not actually learned it from the teacher's lips that you are unable to maintain that the teachers say such and such. Go and learn it from our own teacher. Where shall I go, venerable sir? There is an elder named Maha Dhamma Rakita living in the Tuladhara Pabata Monastery in the Rohana country beyond the Mahaveli River. He knows all the scriptures. Go to him, saying, Good venerable sir, he paid homage to the elder. He went with 500 bhikkhus to the elder Maha Damarakita, and when he had paid homage to him, he sat down. The elder asked, Why have you come to hear the Dhamma, venerable sir? Friend Abaya, they asked me about the Diga and Majima from time to time, but I have not looked at the others for 30 years. Still, you may repeat them in my presence by night, and I shall explain them to you by day. He said, Good Venerable Sir, and he acted accordingly. 54. The inhabitants of the village had a large pavilion built at the door of his dwelling, and they came daily to hear the Dhamma. Explaining by day what had been repeated by night, the elder Damarakita eventually completed the instruction. Then he sat down on a mat on the ground before the elder Abaya and said, Friend, explain a meditation subject to me. What are you saying, venerable sir? Have I not heard it all from you? What can I explain to you that you do not already know? Senior elder said, This path is different for one who has actually traveled by. So it's significant here is he is putting himself lower than the junior monk. And it's a, quite a shock to the junior monk that he should do that. But he's making a point of the fact that he, with, even with all his learning, he still doesn't know how to practice, or he still doesn't feel confident taking his own intellectual knowledge of the Dhamma as a guide for how to practice, which is fair. It's quite possible for scholar monks and Buddhist scholars to misinterpret or be unable to properly interpret the teachings and relying on someone who has, has direct experience of the teachings is more reliable. It is possible for someone with no instruction to read the Buddha's teaching or learn the Buddha's teaching and, and apply it themselves with good results, but it's much more hesitant and much more fraught with dangers of getting it wrong. It's far more preferable to find someone who has direct experience and take them as your teacher. So the point that is coming up is that for this guy, this guy doesn't, not, the books aren't an impediment because he's not egotistical or anything he's and he's not attached to the idea that book learning is meaningful he's a, willing to just discard his status as a teacher in order to gain instruction from someone who has direct knowledge so it means he he is he sees that the limitations of book knowledge the elder abbe was then it seems a stream enterer when the elder abbe had given his teacher a meditation subject he returned to Anuradhapura. Later, while he was expounding the Dhamma in the Brazen Palace, he heard that the elder had attained Nibbana. 
On hearing this, he said, Bring me my robe, friends. Then he put on the robe and said, The Arahant path befits our teacher, friends. Our teacher was a true thoroughbred. He sat down on a mat before his own Dhamma pupil and said, Explain a meditation subject to me. The Arahant path befits our teacher, friends. For such as these, books are no impediment. Supernormal powers are the supernormal powers of the ordinary man. They are hard to maintain, like a prone infant or like a young cone, and the slightest thing breaks them. But they are an impediment for insight, not for concentration, since they are obtained through concentration. So the supernormal powers are an impediment that should be severed by one who seeks insight. The others are impediment to be severed by one who seeks concentration. This is in the first place a detailed explanation of the impediments. So here it um, makes a comparison between vipassana and samadhi. I, I don't see that. Usually it's vipassana and samatha. That's what you'd expect. But here... Sapana vipassanaya pali bodo hotina samadhisa. That's strange. Because vipassana requires samadhi, just a different. I mean, yeah, they're using, he's using the word samadhi here to mean apana, nupachara, samadhi, and samatha practice. I guess it's just splitting hairs to say that vipassana, nitpicking to say vipassana requires samadhi because he's just, here he's referring to what we normally think of as samadhi, which is the the jhanas and that sort of thing. I would say even for samatha, they could be a, a distraction to keep you from using samatha practice for the right purpose. I just, I think he's just pointing out that technically you can't call them a, a distraction because, or a, an impediment because, well, it's one of the results of practicing samatha, but. It doesn't really make them not an impediment. They can still be an impediment to to pure samatha and for using tranquility for its purpose. But as he says, it's only ultimately an impediment that gets in the way of using samatha for vipassana. 57. Approach the good friend, the giver of a meditation subject. Meditation subjects are of two kinds. That is, generally useful meditation subjects and special meditation subjects. Herein, loving kindness towards the community of bhikkhus, etc., and also mindfulness of death are what are called generally useful meditation subjects. Some say perception of foulness, too. When a bhikkhu takes up a meditation subject, he should first develop loving kindness towards the community of bhikkhus within the boundary, limiting it at first to all bhikkhus in this monastery. In this way, may they be happy and free from affliction. Then he should develop it towards all deities within the boundary, then towards all the principal people in the village, that is his alms resort, then to all human beings there and to all living beings dependent on the human beings. With loving kindness towards the community of bhikkhus, he produces kindliness in his co residents. Then they are easy for him to live with. With loving kindness towards the deities within the boundary, he is protected by kindly deities with lawful protection. With loving kindness towards the principal people in the village, that is his alms resort, his requisites are protected by well disposed principal people with lawful protection. With loving kindness to all human beings, there he goes about without incurring their dislike since they trust him. With loving kindness to all living beings, he can wander unhindered everywhere. With mindfulness of death, thinking, I have got to die, he gives up improper search, and with a growing sense of urgency, he comes to live without attachment. When his mind is familiar with the perception of foulness, 
then even divine objects do not tempt his mind to greed. Lawful, I w just to point out, because it's not really how we say that, but um, the meaning here is these protections that are given are, are righteous or rightful. Dhammika. Dhammika means in accordance with the Dhamma, or you can just say proper, righteous. It's not quite lawful, but the meaning is these. it's right for them to protect them. They protect him with, rightfully. Why? Because he is kind. He deserves it, is the idea. This this paragraph is um, the origin of, I think, I don't know if there's another one, but this the, the idea in this paragraph is where it originates what we call the opening ceremony. So when a person comes to take meditation, there is um, a number of things that they will recite in our tradition. First, they will ask, first they will give themselves over. Actually, I think that's, no, that's coming up. I'm not sure if it's coming up. Mahasi Sayada talks about it. How you give yourself up to the Buddha, you give yourself up to your teacher, you ask the teacher for meditation practice, you send loving kindness to yourself and all beings, you remember the fact that you're going to die, uh, and you reflect on how what you're about to undertake is the path to Nibbana, it's the path of all enlightened beings. Then finally you declare this practice as a way of revering the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, a way of paying homage to them through homage of practice. 69. So these are called generally useful, and they are called meditation subjects since they are needed generally and desirable owing to their great helpfulness, and since they are subjects for the meditation work intended. What is called a special meditation subject is that one from among the 40 meditation subjects that is suitable to a man's own temperament. It is special, parihariya, because he must carry it, pari Aritabhata, constantly about with him, and because it is the proximate cause for each higher stage of development. So it is the one who gives this twofold meditation subject that is called the giver of a meditation subject. 61. The good friend is one who possesses such special qualities as this. He is revered and dearly loved and one who speaks and suffers speech. The speech he utters is profound. He does not urge without a reason, and so on. He is wholly solicitous of welfare and partial to progress. Because of the words beginning, Ananda, it is owing to my being a good friend to them that living beings subject to birth are freed from birth. It is only the fully enlightened one who possesses all the aspects of the good friend. Since this is so, while it, he is available, only a meditation subject taken in the Blessed One's presence is well taken. But after his final attainment of Nibbana, it is proper to take it from any one of the 80 great disciples still living. When they are no more available, one who wants to take a particular meditation subject should take it from someone with cankers destroyed, who has, by means of that particular meditation subject, produced a fourth-fold and five-fold jhana, and has reached the destruction of cankers by augmenting insight, and had that jhana as its proximate cause. 63. But how then does someone with cankers destroyed declare himself thus? I am one whose cankers are destroyed. Why not? He declares himself when he knows that his instructions will be carried out. Did not the elder Asakuta spread out his leather mat in the air and sitting cross-legged on it, explain a meditation subject to a bhikkhu who was starting his meditation subject because he knew that uh, that bhikkhu 
was one who would carry out his instructions for the meditation subject. So unfortunately, it's more common for people to falsely claim to be Arahant. Mahasi Sayada talks about this, how it's, I mean, he, 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 he's got a point here, but it's far, it's far preferable not to brag about one's attainments, obviously. And uh, does it, does, do they get proclaimed? Do, does one's attainments get proclaimed to other monks? That's the point here is this is to other monks. Yes, but still usually better not. I mean, you'll see, um, there's a, an example of a monk who's looking after an, a senior monk who's dying. And the younger monk says, how do you know if someone's enlightened? And the senior monk says, oh, it's really hard to know. Even if someone were to look after a, an arahant when they were ill, they still might not know. And he was he was indirectly telling this monk that he was an arahant, but he wouldn't say it directly. 64. So if someone with cankers destroyed is available, that is good. If not, then one should take it uh, from a non-returner, a once-returner, a stream-enterer, an ordinary man who has obtained jhana, one who knows three pitikas, one who knows two pitikas, one who knows one pitika, in descending order, according uh, as available. If not, even one who knows one pitika is available, then it should be taken from one who is familiar with one collection together with its commentary and one who is himself conscientious. For a teacher such as this, who knows the text, guards the heritage, and protects the tradition, will follow the teacher's opinion rather than his own. Hence the ancient elders said three times, one who is conscientious will guard it. So valuable to note is you don't need someone who is you don't need someone who is enlightened. I mean, obviously, you're in dire straits if you don't have someone who has who has uh, practical experience in the practice. But it's not entirely necessary. There are, are cases of unenlightened beings with unenlightened uh, unenlightened teachers with enlightened students because they were able to teach well well enough. But uh, it's interesting he points out the word conscientious. The idea here, I think, is one who is true to the teachings, so they don't add their own interpretations. And you'll see this, this is a quality more found in people who have practiced, that they are truer to the teachings rather than adding their own interpretations or reinterpreting things or quarreling with the existing interpretations. They're conscientious in the sense that they tend to go along with the given interpretations. For someone who's not enlightened, that's pretty important if they're going to share the teachings with others. Because it's, I mean, it's obviously very common for someone to get the wrong interpretation and misrepresent the Dhamma as a result of their own lack of enlightenment, lack of progress or attainment. So if someone is conscientious, means they guard the teachings and they try their best to present it as it was presented to them. Yeah. In the Singha version uses the word Lajji. Lajji probably somebody who has shame. Yeah, well Lajji is the Pali word. So they're they're just they're just using the Pali word. I think the idea is scrupulous. Scrupulous in that they won't say the Buddha taught this when the Buddha didn't teach that. I think that's the idea here. Someone who will in this context it's someone who will authentically or accurately, uh, faithfully, that's the word I'm looking for, who will faithfully represent the teachings. Ante, I had a question about verse 61. It says, uh, he is revered and dearly loved, and one who speaks and suffers speech. Uh, does that mean listens, suffers? Yeah, so suffers here means is patient with or bears. Literally, it would be something like he bears speech. So when 
when people say things to him. I'm not quite sure what I was looking at this as well. I'm not quite sure what it's referring to. It could be the idea that if someone reprimands them, scolds them, they are uh, they accept it. They're patient. It could also mean when someone asks them questions, they are patient with the person who asks questions and they don't get annoyed. So I'm not quite sure what it what, what it's referring to. I guess it's probably just generally. What that's a right? He's a speaker and one who tolerates. The the idea is tolerates. Now, what it what it means by tolerate speech? Um, it's a bit ambiguous, but I, I guess it's just generally. Probably, I mean, I guess it, most glaringly obvious is when you have to meet with students, like I meet with many students every day, and you've got to be quite patient to listen to what they have to say. Yeah. Thank you, Dante. So providing one with a meditation subject, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Bhante, uh, means a, a specific technique of meditation. And it, it was said that it, it is based on the temperament of the meditator. Is that how it's done and nowadays? I mean, in the Buddha's time when Buddha was able to the that well you can yeah. you read about the temperaments when we get to it but um remember we're not practicing these types of meditation so in vipassana it's a little different so all these refer to samatha meditation yeah okay thank you yeah there's going to be a long portion of this text that deals mainly with samatha which I mean, it touches on vipassana tangentially, but it's mostly the development of samatha. And there's the long sections on the, the magical powers and the abilities, which is quite interesting to read about. There's many stories that are quite entertaining in, in the part that talks about magical powers. In some ways, the, this is great for even us to, to read about because it gives a survey of what else is possible. And it helps you see the the extent and the limitations of samatha. Once you read about it, it shouldn't make you think, oh, this is what I should be doing instead. It should make you realize, yeah, that's all that samatha is. It's 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 all of this, which is you know impressive, but still below what you get from vipassana. Bhante, there is a question in the chat. Um, the question is. But loving kindness is still useful to oneself and others. Well, we'll learn about loving kindness, but it, it was it was just said there that loving kindness is a um, generally useful one. If you read it, we just went over that. There are certain types of meditation that are useful just generally that you don't have to take special. Special here means it's, the word isn't special, but he's he's translating it as special means one that you especially take up or you intentionally uh, or you intensively practice. And that's what this is. This section is going to talk about it. it. Basically, it's not talking about generally useful. He mentions generally useful ones that are just useful all the time. But uh, what he's going to talk about here is one that you take up especially you take up as uh, for special focus as your main practice loving kindness towards yourself isn't actually encouraged it's taught as a example he says and so i i say, i bring that up because it's quite common for people to want to focus on loving themselves and compassion towards themselves here we've got a bit of a thing where one monk keeps teaching the foreign meditators to be compassionate towards themselves and it sounds good, and it's not like it's anti-Buddhist, but it's missing the point, and it's diverting, distracting people from what they really should be doing. Suppose you have pain and you feel compassion towards yourself, or you have, suppose you're distracted and you feel compassion towards yourself. It, it, it's a good sentiment, because you. the point is, you shouldn't be angry at yourself because you're distracted, which is a common problem. Meditators get distracted and then they get frustrated and they think I'm not a very good meditator or they have, you know, emotions arise and they feel I'm a bad meditator. And if you have compassion towards yourself, you'll, you won't be so hard on yourself is the idea. But it's a problem because in mindfulness, we want them to do something different. We want them to face the 
the self-hatred, the anger, the criticism, the, the frustration. We want them to be mindful of that. So if instead you're being so-called compassionate towards yourself, you're, you're not being mindful. That's the problem. So as far as loving kindness to oneself, it's not really emphasized. You have to read the section and you'll see where people got this idea of having loving kindness towards yourself. He says it's as an example, but it's not very useful. It's much more useful to be have loving kindness towards others. You love yourself and then you use that as a template to be able to try your best to love people who you don't love, who you don't have kindness towards, who you're not friendly towards. Dante, in paragraph 51, we read about affliction when one says to, it's, uh, to himself or herself, I'm not your slave or your hireling. Uh, is that in, in a way like a kind of a mantra or is that talking to oneself like, a, I don't know, mot motivation to oneself? Well, it is. It is motivation. Could you use it as a mantra? You could, I suppose. I mean, uh, like a mantra is used to focus the mind or to get yourself yeah. back on the track. It would be fine to do that. I mean, it's like reflection on death. It's not like that, but it's the same kind of idea where you say something that's to encourage you. Nahang tui hang da so, I'm not your slave. Apostrophize, the, the word is scolds, one scolds oneself. Maybe you remember Chakupala said something similar. When he continued to, to meditate, even though that would um, um, afflict his eyes. Ante, we have another question in the chat. May I ask about the duties towards parents for an adoptee? I found my biological mother in Sri Lanka this week after many years of searching. I finally got to tell her that I'm doing well. She was very happy to hear that and I feel we can now both find peace with this. I grew up in Denmark with adoptive family and now live in Greenland. Now that I found her in Sri Lanka, do I then have the same Buddhist duties towards her that Sanka mentions? I would like to take care of her, but as a layperson working in the world, I can't easily visit Sri Lanka or Denmark, and she doesn't speak English. Sometimes this worries me. I try to be mindful of the worries and note them and the reaction towards them. Thank you for your Dhamma service and all these years. Your teachings and guidance have changed my life in a wholesome and positive way. Well, she did uh, give birth to you, and that's a big deal. So you don't don't have to make too big of a deal out of these things. Uh, ultimately, your relationship your par with your parents is not the most important thing in your life, but it it is something that resonates with us. It's all mainly how it affects your mind, and sometimes these things affect our mind in ways we don't even realize. We just take them for granted, take our parents for granted, and don't realize how how much of an effect it has. So it's good to recognize that she, even though she didn't do much after you were born, she uh, she did give birth to you. Or may not have, I don't I don't know the situation, but someone adopt someone who's adopted at birth, well they still took nine months to care for you in their womb. So uh Again, duties are, are duties are more conventional than anything. These duties towards other people, they're not our true duties, but they're duties that keep harmony and harmony in your mind. They make your they they settle your mind, make you feel good about yourself, make you feel confident that you're a good person, that you're you've done the right thing, you've done what's necessary, and they just maintain harmony in, in relationships. They're considered proper and. Uh, reasonable and they support you in your practice but you don't have to obsess over them our true duties are practice and study of the Buddhist teaching there's only two duties in the Buddha Sasana if you want to know about these sorts of duties you can read the Sigalovada Sutta in the Diganikaya 
Which duties to all your relations. I'd say we have another question in the chat. Um, the question is, is mindfulness not about being compassionate towards oneself? We are observing what our mind is thinking without judgment. The same way we want to be compassionate without being judgment. Well, I think so. I'm not quite sure. I mean, I, I have to be a little more detailed about what exactly you're saying, but I think I think so. I mean, it's funny because I had someone recently because again, I'm having I'm faced with this because this monk keeps telling everybody to be compassionate towards yourself. And I said, you know, when you feel pain, note pain, pain. And she said, well, shouldn't we just move so we be compassionate towards us? I mean, should she said, I, I just want to move. Shouldn't I be compassionate? I said, yeah, be mindful. And then you're compassionate towards yourself. I want, I'm, we're being compassionate by being mindful because mindfulness is something that frees you from suffering. The suffering is not in the pain. The suffering is in the disliking of the pain. So when you're mindful of it, that's the most compassionate thing you can do. Because you don't want yourself to suffer. The way I hesitate is because mindfulness is not about being compassionate, but you could argue that it's the best way to, if you are have a desire for yourself not to suffer, it is the it is the most compassionate thing you can do is to practice mindfulness. But mindfulness is not about being compassionate. Mindfulness is about grasping objects as they are, to see them clearly, and to prevent the arising of attachment and dependence and so on. That's what mindfulness is about. So um, an announcement I like just to let you all know. You'll be the first to maybe hear this. It looks like we're moving to Sri Lanka, back to Sri Lanka. So I lived first in Sri Lanka for two years and I stayed with this really great monk who was very supportive of our work and helped us start a meditation center there. And I left after I got dengue and felt like it wasn't safe to stay there any longer. Well, it was it was also m much about the, the infrastructure at the time wasn't great, but uh, the infrastructure's improved and there's now a dengue vaccine. And more importantly, the, the monk who I lived with has invited me to, to basically take over his monastery. I mean, He'll still be the head monk there, but he wants me to take over the running and uh, the usage of it as a meditation center. So it looks like we might be going before the rains to start a center there. So does that mean in July? Yes. And uh, there would there be a um, um, meditation center as well? I mean, could meditator get, go there? Yes, there, he says there are 12 rooms. So mm -hmm. it's not a lot because we're bringing, I'm bringing four monks from here with me. But I mean, that still leaves, should leave three or four rooms right away. And probably one of the first things we'll do is build some more rooms. So when meditators can go there? Well, probably right away. That's what's great about this is that it's probably pretty immediate. We'll have to figure out uh, food, but I don't think that's, that's going to delay anything. That's just uh, something we'll have to do quickly to make sure there's food for everyone. It's up on a mountain. This isn't the place I was at before, so I have no pictures or video of it. But I was there for two. I stayed there for two days and got bit by a snake and left. But um, well, the reason I left actually is there was no internet up there, uh, and I was doing internet even back then, just doing internet teachings. But the internet's better up there now, he says, and it's just an ideal place to uh, idyllic place to practice. It's on the top of a mountain beside a waterfall, in a tea, it's a tea tea plantation. How did you receive the arms, Bhante, earlier? Like, were there villagers uh, coming to offer So I went, on, I, I went on alms round, but he said we didn't have to. When I was there, I went, the, f the few days I was there, I went through the village on alms and didn't get very much. It's a very, it's like a, a mountain village. So there's, there's not, I mean, people are not wealthy and they're not really, 
probably not very religious, but they were bringing food yeah. to the monastery. And this was this was what ten years ago at least, right? So I don't know what it's like now. He says it's it's quite developed now. Maybe you can, if you ever have time or or interest, you can go visit for me and take some pictures and see what you think. I would probably come with you, Bhante, when you visit. Okay. It's quite far away, I guess. These days, it's uh, because of the rain, there's uh, floods and uh, uh, okay. uh, mountain slide. So travel is not very convenient these days, but uh, hopefully it will get better by July. Do you have a specific date in July, Bhante? No, I'm thinking around the 15th I will go. And can we ask about a bit about the weather in August and September? Would it be, would it be very uh, warm, very hot? It, in Sri, Sri Lanka, there's only one weather, rain. <laughs> yeah. Temperature is the same. Where Bante is going, the, uh, the temperature is uh, quite probably colder than Colombo, so you might enjoy it. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. Up on the mountain, it's very cool. Pretty cool all year round, I guess. Sri Lanka is closer to the equator, much closer to the equator than most places. So there's yeah. not so much of a temperature fluctuation. But what does cool mean in terms of one needs well, many? It's still pretty warm. I mean, anything below 25 Celsius is cold for us. It's really going to be a great place, and I think there's a lot of potential there. Bhante, we have another question in the chat. Um, the question is, should students put an application down? Well, it's going to take a bit for us to get everything up and going, but that's a good question. Yeah, I take it one step at a time. Uh, putting an application down right now, I don't think so. I think uh, when Bhante goes there and sees exactly what's uh, the situation and how many rooms we have for available for students and the food situation, uh, I guess then we can uh, know how many applications we can take, uh, what is allowed in terms of the monastery, how much, you know, is allowed for students to come. And because it's all local out there, right? We still don't know much. Uh, yeah, in if, parts of the world. if someone wants to, if someone feels like they've got limited time and, and it would be, they would really like to come at a certain time, they could put an application down now, like just to make sure that they get in if we have lim if we end up having limited spots and too many people wanting to come, but we just can't confirm applications, so we won't be able to confirm your application until after we get there. And I I, I would think pretty soon after we get there, we'll be able to confirm applications at least the first few that we get. So if you want to apply in advance, I I, I think that could be possible. Just be clear that you won't get a confirmation until we get get there. Bante, I uh, put down an application for September for Thailand, and I should cancel it. Yeah, should I cancel it? it? Looks well, it's not a hundred percent. Like the 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 real factor now, as far as I can see, is simply that we don't have visas yet, and I assume it's all there's lots of time to get visas. So I don't see any reason why we should be here, but. It could happen that for some reason the visas get delayed, and we have we see that we can't. So what we're dealing with now is the rains. The rainy season starts. The the monastic rains season starts in the on uh, July twenty twenty first. So if we can't get there before that, we can't go. And we could, but probably shouldn't. We still should. Actually, we could we could enter the rains late, which wouldn't be a big deal. So, yeah, I would be even probably keen to do that if necessary. If the if the monastery is near a tea plantation, I would imagine that uh, most of the villagers are Tamil because they are the ones huh. working in the tea plantation. So maybe that's why you didn't get much provisions last time. Well, I do know that when I got snake, when I got bit by a snake, we went to a doctor kind of not a doctor but like a witch doctor a shaman in the village who tried to chant the uh, kanda Purita for me but he mangled it terribly but he at least tried <laughs> so he 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 knew sort of knew the monk the kanda Purita. 
And he did some burnt some he did some witch doctor stuff. And another question, did the monastery uh, function as a meditation center before? I mean, will, will there be stewards for meditations or will the, there be a set of rules for meditation church meditators? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Um, well, the, the simple question is yes. The simple answer is yes, it was. It is technically a meditation center he's a meditation monk um but he said he doesn't have really nobody really comes there he said i'm not famous so people don't come all right well that's, that's all for me for this week i have to go have thank a good you, week everyone Thank you so much, Pante. Thank you all.